Now, if that was a muscle that was, that was damaged, then absolutely that would happen because muscles have a great blood supply. The problem is, is that passive tissues like ligaments and discs have a very poor blood supply. And so when they get traumatized, even if it's at a microscopic level, just a little bit of stress to, to, to the ligament more than it's designed to handle, then they often can't repair as quickly as you're damaging them, especially if you're a professional sports person or you've got a recurrent uh, habit of moving in a certain way or sitting in a certain way. Then, so you know, back to the disc example, if you tend to sit down with a flexed spine every day, and that's the way you sit, that's the way you, you are at work, that's the way you drive your car or sit on your sofa at home in the evenings, then the cumulative stress across maybe 15, 20, 25 years longer into that disc will mean that the same extreme strength that it has uh, as a healthy disc will gradually decrease and decrease and decrease over the years. And then at a certain point, you may bend to pick something up, you may twist to, to uh, let's say, strike a hockey ball in a, in a hockey match and pop the disc ruptures. And um, that really is a great example of the straw that breaks the camel's back. FC2 Chaos to order From chaos to order Here we go From chaos to order From chaos to order FC2 Welcome to FC2 O Solo. Today I'll be interviewing no one. In fact, this is the first of a series of solo podcasts that will be interspersed with my podcast with guests. So uh, you may have noticed we had no po podcast last week, um, and that was because we had a big release with Mark Sisson interviewing me for his Primal Blueprint podcast, uh, where we talked about two recent papers that we've published, all about archetypal rest postures, primal patterns, and instinctive sleep postures. So that's quite a fascinating topic, and uh, you can see that, uh, I'll put that on the show notes. Uh, so if you want to catch up on that, then fantastic. Also, I just wanted to clarify a point um, that I made in my podcast with Sherry Tenpenny, the second one, which was her Q&A uh, episode eight, where I mentioned um, that uh, if a child is ultrasounded in the womb, then it increases the risk of left-handedness. And I used that exact turn of phrase. And of course, you know, that could be misinterpreted and I didn't mean it to come across. I meant to clarify a little bit. And that, that is that there is one line of thought that if the, um, the, the, the standard sort of dominance in human populations is to be uh, right-handed and therefore left hemisphere dominant. And one of the, the, the lines of thought is that when uh, a child is left-handed, that there may have been some subtle damage to the left hemisphere. And so they preferentially pick the right hemisphere as their dominant hemisphere and therefore become left-handed. Now, Obviously, that's very controversial, and I don't know uh, that there's any strong evidence behind it. But one of the things that it ties in with, which of course relates back to the whole discussion with Sherry Tenpenny, is that um, kids that are on the autistic spectrum have a much higher instance of left-handedness. So it was one of those kind of connections that I actually failed to make in that discussion, but that was what I was alluding to there. So join me for this episode where we're going to be discussing Panjabi's model of joint stability and all the different ramifications of that, and how it can benefit us, how it can benefit clients and how it can benefit students that are learning about human function. Enjoy the show. Here we go. Hello and welcome to our first edition of FC2O Solo. So um, this is Solo, it is me just talking to you and the theme for this uh, series is simplicity on the other side of complexity. So um, with that in mind, what I'm going to just do is just remind listeners of the, um, the preview to the, to the podcast where I introduce the whole idea of from chaos to order. And um, the name, Simplicity on the Other Side of Complexity, relates to a graph which I described. And uh, if you want to see the graph, then it's in the show notes on our website. 
And um, we also have a video of this on our Vimeo page. And the details of that can be found in the description under the podcast. So the image is essentially of a graph, which is a bell-shaped curve. And uh, up the left-hand side of the graph is uh, the y-axis saying complexity. And across the bottom of the graph is the x-axis saying elegance. And um, what it's alluding to is that when we, whenever we start out in any new endeavor of learning or um, mastery of a given area, skill set, etc., then we start off pretty dumbed down, let's say. We're, we're pretty uh, poor at, let's say, taking up a new sport or new instrument, or you're learning a new course at school, at college, at university, or you're starting school even. But everything's pretty dumbed down when we start off. So our elegance is fairly poor, the complexity is low. But as you move across and you start to go up the levels of complexity, you start to head towards a peak. And your elegance at playing the sport, playing the instrument, uh, describing the field of knowledge that you're diving into gets more and more elegant. And um, ultimately, you move from a kind of beginner phase where it's all dumbed down, very, very basic, very simple. And you move into a, a kind of complexity phase as the as the complexity increases, of course, and you become more and more of an expert in that discipline. So ultimately, you reach a peak of expertise. And beyond that expertise, what you find is that the complexity starts to slowly drop down. So someone who's a master, take someone like Roger Federer, for example, uh, as a tennis player, an expert tennis player. He's not just an expert. There's lots of experts out there, a lot of lots of coaches lots of great players, but people that don't make it to the same pinnacle that uh, Roger Federer does. And that's because he's gone beyond the other side of the complexity curve and he has sort of moved into what we would call the mastery phase. So he's a master of tennis or it might be a master of taekwondo or of playing piano or whatever. And these guys really don't have to think about it. Think of Elton John or someone like that on the piano. He could just sit down and he can play chords and melodies and um you know, sub melodies and harmonies and all sorts of stuff, because he's just a master of that discipline. And um, again, many experts in the piano, but he is an example of someone who is a master. And this is the same in, uh, in fields of knowledge as well. But the thing about masters is that they can make things extremely simple, and they can help to explain very complex topics um, or to demonstrate complex um, skills in what seems like an effortless way, and that's why I used Roger Federer as an example, he just seems to be effortless in the way he plays tennis. So <clears throat> the quote that I, again, I mentioned it in the preview, but um, is there's a great quote from a guy called Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. And he says, for the simplicity on this side of complexity, I wouldn't give you a fig. But for the simplicity on the other side of complexity, for that, I would give you anything I have. And so what he's talking about is mastery. And of course, mastery of any given uh, discipline takes about 10,000 hours. The research shows it takes about 10,000 hours of, uh, not just 10,000 hours of doing the skill, but actually focused attention and uh, contemplation and, uh, you know, really, really a form of concentration, which is an interesting word because it means that you're focusing when you concentrate then it's the opposite of eccentration, which is where things go outwards and you drift off, etc. So concentration. And so really, uh, you know, there's many factors that contribute towards making a master. But um, for today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about a model, uh, because a model is something that gives you simplicity on the other side of complexity, called the Punjabi's model. Now, Punjabi is uh, an orthopedic specialist. He's He's a master of his craft. And he developed this model. And I found this model so useful, not only for me to understand the human body, uh, but also to help uh, students understand things more easily, to help patients understand things more easily. And I think you'll find it really useful too. So just to preface it a little bit, I'm going to explain that, you know, a model, uh, a model, and this is this is from a guy called John Hollins, who essentially studies modeling. And um is a uh, complexity theorist and a a, a chaos theorist. So he's he's a master of his craft. And he says, a well-conceived model can yield organized complexities that repay decades and centuries of study. And I would say that Punjabi's model is a great example of that. 
He goes on to say that this capacity for prediction provides a deep connection between modeling and emergence. So in other words, the emergence of new ideas, the emergence of um, mastery, the emergence of new skill sets, etc. Okay. The usually simple specification of a model, what is called the transition function, can yield a limitless array of consequences and predictions. And if that transition function is faithful, in other words, if the model is accurate, then we can make predictions into the indefinite future. Okay, so a model is an extremely powerful tool. And to give you a sort of more real world example of that, um, there's a guy called Gleick who wrote a book on chaos theory. And he says that um, the choice is always the same. You can make your model more complex and more faithful to reality, or you can make it simpler and easier to handle. Only the most naive scientist believes that the perfect model is the one that perfectly represents reality. Such a model would have the same drawbacks as a map as large and detailed as the city it represents. A map depicting every street, every building, every tree, every pothole, every inhabitant, and every map. Were such a map possible, its specificity would defeat its purpose, which is to generalize and to abstract. So imagine that, a map that is essentially the same size as the city that you're trying to get around. It's just, it's just not helpful. So you need to make it simpler, but you know, with enough detail that you're able to navigate that new territory. And that's what Punjabi's model does. Now, some people find this kind of way of working um, challenging to their minds. And quite often, <laughs> interestingly enough, it's people that have reached a level of um, expert. Uh, so they, they, they've, they've gone from the beginner phase on that complexity curve. They've gone in right up that complexity curve to the top, and they are experts in their discipline, but they've not yet mastered it. And so what that means is that they, they look at a simple map and they go, well, that's far too simple. That doesn't explain everything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've studied far too much to believe that that could really help. And uh, so what Gleick says is that what's actually the case is that as physicians and scientists learning all 50,000 parts of everything, we resent the possibility that there are, in fact, universal elements of motion. So universal truths, simple uh, understandings that allow us to essentially get um, not quite the level of mastery but but to get the insights of the master but in a very simple way and that's what a, a really good model does and Punjabi's model is a great example of that okay so I'm going to describe Punjabi's model to you and again if you're just listening on the podcast then then you, you have to imagine it and that's no bad thing but if you want to see the model then again it's it's on the show notes on mattwarden.com and it's on our Vimeo page. Okay, so the model is essentially a triangle or a triad, and at the top of that triangle, you've got neural, and what that means is the nervous system. On the bottom right-hand corner, you've got active, and that's the muscular system. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, you've got passive, and that's things like the ligaments and the joints and the bones and the connective tissues, things in the body that essentially are part of the structure, part of the biomechanics, but they're passive. They wouldn't do anything on their own. You think of a skeleton standing in a room, it doesn't move. And the reason it doesn't move is because it has no active component to move it. And even if it did have an active component, that active component would need a nervous system to get those muscles to move. So that's Panjabi's model in its very simplistic state. So why, why this model is important is that it not only tells us a lot about anatomy and physiology and how the body functions, but it also gives us great insight into things like injuries. So if you've been injured or if you were to get injured, then Punjabi's model can help you understand how to recover from that injury. Or if you're a practitioner of some sort that helps people with injuries, well, then it will help you to help the patient or the client, and it will help you to educate the patient or the client to um, understand their situation. Okay, so injuries is the first thing, but it also really helps with performance, and we're going to talk about that. It can help with health in general, um, and of course, Panjabi developed the model for musculoskeletal health. But as you'll see, it is um, important for so much more than just the musculoskeletal system. Um, and then it will help explain things like in medicine at the moment, one of the, the key, uh, the different model, which we may well do one of these FC20 solo uh, sections on, is called the biopsychosocial model. And it helps to explain a bit more about the biopsychosocial model as well, so that we get a bit bigger context to understand 
our own situation and our patient situation or loved ones situations, especially when they have health challenges uh, and how to avoid those things, how to prevent them. And then also things like gut health and many, many more things beyond it. So a good model is something that can explain many, many things very simplistically so that we're able to get our heads around what would otherwise be quite a complex topic. Now, I'm going to take a few examples when I go through the model. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the model and explain it in a little bit more detail. But then I'm going to take some injuries, which are quite common. So I'm going to look at anterior cruciate ligament injuries. That's a very common sports injury. I'm going to look at um, shoulder injuries, um, in particular, maybe shoulder impingement or rotator cuff injuries. So you may have experienced that or know, one, know someone who's, who's had a rotator cuff injury. I'm going to talk about low back pain. And I'm also going to give another example of ankle sprain. So if you've ever experienced a sprained ankle or low back pain or a shoulder injury or a knee injury, like a cruciate ligament injury, well, then this should give you some insights. Uh, and indeed, it may not be you. It may be a friend or a colleague or a loved one or a teammate, those kinds of things. So let's dig into the detail of this very simple, but very uh, sort of profound model. So as I mentioned, at the top of the triangle, you've got what Punjabi calls the neural subsystem. The neural subsystem essentially means the nervous system, and it means really anything that um, both affects the muscles, but also receives information from the muscles and receives information from any other part of the body, including the passive subsystem, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, and things that may influence those systems, such as your beliefs, your values, your emotions, your organ health, um, the way that you are uh, handling stresses in life, and so on and so forth. So that's the neural system in a, in a snapshot. Then we've got the active system, and the active system is the muscles, as I mentioned earlier, but the muscles can be really usefully divided into two main categories. And those two categories are the deeper muscles, which tend to be deep in the joints or deep in the spine. And those muscles are what's known as tonic muscles because they hold tone and they tend to be involved in holding posture. Um, they are they have very good endurance, so they can hold you up all day long. You don't, you don't generally get tired, even though you may have been sat down or stood up or walking around all day. Those muscles will keep you upright all day long. Okay, those are, those are deep muscles, and therefore sometimes they're called the inner muscles or the inner unit muscles. So that's, that's one part of that active or muscular system. The other part is the outer muscles. And so those are the muscles that we can see. They're things like the biceps and in the arm and the triceps in the arm. They're the pec muscles you can see. They're the abdominal muscles, the six-pack you can see. They're the quadricep muscles in the thigh or the hamstring or the calf muscles. They are outer muscles. And those muscles are involved in moving us. So they move us. They move our joints. And um, they can also have quite good endurance, but actually they are more fatigable. So in, in other words, what happens is if you were to, uh, let's say, climb up some stairs, then those muscles are the ones that are doing the climbing. If you were to go for a sprint or a run, those are the muscles that are propelling you forwards. And they have a higher uh, number of fast twitch fibers in them. And the fast twitch fibers move you powerfully, move you quickly but they fatigue early. That's why if you were to sprint now, you could only sprint at your top speed for about eight to 10 seconds. Now you can still go, keep going pretty fast for perhaps 20, 30, 40 seconds, but most people within eight seconds or so, they'll have dropped below their top speed. Um, and um, so the, or you know, indeed, not just about speed, but about lifting heavy things. Now, if you were to lift something really heavy, uh, perhaps it's a weight in the gym, or it could be you're moving house and you're lifting a table or a sofa or a piano or something. You can only do that for so long and generally for quite short periods. Um, so those are the outer muscles. So in that active component of the, of the model, so we've talked about neural and active so far, the active system or the muscular system has the inner muscles, which are tonic and postural, and the outer muscles, which are what's called phasic because they phase on and off. If you think of when you walk or when you cycle or when you row or when you swim, you contract a muscle and then it relaxes a little bit and you contract it again and you relax again. So when you're walking, for example, as you take a step, you contract the muscles in the front of the leg to swing the leg forwards. 
the leg hits the ground and the muscles at the back then contract to pull you forwards, okay, or push you forwards depending on, uh, depending on <laughs> what angle you're at, okay. So that's the active system. Now the passive system is really quite interesting because the passive system sounds a bit dull. It sounds like it doesn't do too much, but the passive system is the ligaments uh, in particular and the joint capsules. So these are kind of connective tissues. The fascia sometimes is another, is another name for connective tissues, uh, which you find throughout the body and it holds the organs in place and it contributes to the stability of the joints. You find it holding the muscles together. So the fascia is a very important connective tissue. But um, so are things like discs in the spine. So you've probably heard of people getting disc injuries in their back or slipping a disc is the colloquial term for that, which isn't that accurate, but, uh, but it's, it's what a lot of people know it as. And that would be an example of damage to the passive subsystem in the back if you get a disc injury or if you get a ligament injury or a joint injury. Okay. Now, the function of the passive subsystem is to be a kind of, both, both to provide structural integrity and to hold you together but it also is designed to be a backup system for if the muscles don't respond quickly enough. And this is where something like an ankle sprain comes in. Because the reason we sprain an ankle is because we might be walking or, or quite often running. And if the foot hits the ground and the ground is slightly, um, let's say, you know, it's cambered or there's a root or a rock or a, or a stick or something that we didn't see or a dip in the road uh, or a curb. These are all things that often sprain ankles. And what happens is the foot rolls over, you don't have time to react. So your nervous system, so the, the top component on Punjabi's model, the neural system, doesn't have the time to register that your foot has fallen down a hole or whatever it is. And so the muscles cannot be engaged to counteract that. It's just it's happening too quickly. And so then what happens is all of the stress goes into the passive subsystem, the ligaments around the ankle, and they stop your ankle from dislocating. Now, of course, you can strain the ligaments in that process and it can swell right up, but at least you didn't dislocate your ankle. So the ligaments are like a, a backup system for when the muscular system and the nervous system are unable to respond. Okay, so that's, that's the passive subsystem. But interestingly enough, within the passive subsystem, you also have another uh, tissue, which is perhaps slightly unexpected, which is blood. And blood is also part of the passive subsystem. Now, what I mean by that is that blood actually gives the body stability. It gives muscle stability, disc stability, um, vertebrae stability. Whenever there's blood within the system, it makes the system stronger. And so passively, it, it makes the system stronger. So blood is actually part of the passive subsystem as well. Now, if we were to look at injury, for example, you know, so we mentioned ankle sprain, and I earlier mentioned things like cruciate ligament sprains or strains. Um, or tears, you could have uh, shoulder impingements or rotator cuff injuries. These things all impact on Panjabi's model. So let's take um, let's take a cruciate ligament injury. Okay, now cru the cruciate ligament is in the knee, and it's called the cruciate because there's actually two of them, and they they form a cross, which is a cruciate shape. So the most commonly injured of those two ligaments is the anterior cruciate. And um, some of you will have known people that have injured their cruciate, or you know you might know famous sports people. Um, Michael Owen, who is the English striker, is one of the, the best strikers of his generation for, for the, the football side. He famously strained his cruciate ligament at, at one point when he was playing a game for England, and he actually, actually tore it. Now, what happened there, of course, no one knows exactly, but what would have been part of the mechanism is that the muscles wouldn't have been doing what they were supposed to do to stabilize the knee. So what you've got is you've got an injury to the passive subsystem, and the reason that occurred is because the muscles weren't supporting the knee in the way they should have done. So you say, well, why weren't they supporting the knee? Well, he may have been fatigued. I'm not sure that he was in that instance or um, the muscles may have contracted inappropriately. Certainly, he probably transferred his load over his knee in, a, in an unusual way. But what most likely happened with him is that he probably had a muscle firing pattern which had been putting stress into his anterior cruciate ligament for many years. And what happens when you put stress into a ligament or into a disc or into any connective tissue across a period of time is that quite frequently, that ligament will lose its tensile strength. 
So what that means is that it gets weaker and weaker and weaker until a relatively small uh, stress to it can rupture it or tear it. And I think that's probably what happened in Michael Owen's case and in many injuries that we see in sports or in activities of daily living or at work, etc. Now, why was that the case? Well, you know, the reason I say that that was probably the case with Michael Owen is that one other thing he was unfortunately famous for was getting repetitive hamstring strains. And so the hamstring is actually in the human body. It's, it's the one thing, and there's a, there's a particular hamstring, there are three hamstrings in the human body. And one of them, which is the biceps femoris, and it's on the, the, the lateral side of the leg, the outside of the leg, it actually serves as what's called a, a dynamic agonist to the anterior cruciate ligament. So what that means is that it dynamically works in the same way and supports the anterior cruciate ligament. Now, Michael Owen, in one season, had eight hamstring strains. So my guess is that, and he, had, he went on to have many more as well, but my guess is, is that his hamstrings were not doing the job that they should have done throughout his whole career. And so across all those years of playing football, with every step he took, he was getting a degree of shear through his anterior cruciate ligament. So his muscular system was not supporting his passive system, and that ultimately, ultimately meant that he lost connective tissue strength or tensile strength and then just a small um, uh, untoward movement caused his ligament to rupture and this is often the case with many people with these kinds of injuries back injuries shoulder injuries ankle injuries is that it's not so much the actual impact or injury that causes the um, the rupture to occur or the damage to occur but it's that for many many years the muscles that support those structures haven't quite been doing their job properly. Okay, So just to move away from the Michael Owen example for a moment, if we were to look at a disc injury in the back, well, what we know about discs is that when you have a flatter lumbar spine, so the lumbar spine should have a, a curve in it, should have something called a lordosis, and that curve normally allows for optimal distribution of loads through the spine. So the spine should share the loads of every step you take because each time you take a step, you're getting a ground impact. and It's going up and into the spine. And it should share those loads nicely between the disc and the vertebral body at the front and the facet joints at the back. But if you've got a spine which is being held a little bit flat, in other words, it's lost its curve, then most of the load goes into the disc at the front and less goes into the facet joints at the back. And so what this means is that, uh, of course, those tissues are extremely strong and they can handle a lot of load. And one thing I was going to mention with, um, with Michael Owen and his cruciate ligament is that ligaments, which of course are part of this passive subsystem, as are the discs, they have a tensile strength greater than steel. So they're incredibly strong. But if you keep loading them repetitively in an aberrant way or a dysfunctional way, then they progressively get weaker and weaker and weaker. And... Um, you know, you would think that, well, hang on, if something has tensile strength greater than steel, then it should be absolutely fine and there should be no problems with, with transferring load and it should never tear. But the issue is, is that across time, the ligaments themselves and the, and the passive subsystem has typically a very poor blood supply. So what that means is that with someone like Michael Owen, um, if he's stressing his anterior cruciate ligament each time he takes a step when he's playing football, then he's creating a degree of trauma to that ligament. Not, not significant enough to tear it, but enough to create some stress to it. And what you would hope would happen is that after the game that night, his body would go to sleep, it would go into repair mode, and it would repair that ligament. Now, if that was a muscle that was, that was damaged, then absolutely that would happen because muscles have a great blood supply. The problem is, is that passive tissues like ligaments and discs have a very poor blood supply. And so when they get traumatized, even if it's at a microscopic level, just a little bit of stress to, to, to the ligament more than it's designed to handle, then they often can't repair as quickly as you're damaging them, especially if you're a professional sports person or you've got a recurrent uh, habit of moving in a certain way or sitting in a certain way. Then, so you know, back to the disc example, if you tend to sit down with a flexed spine every day, and that's the way you sit, that's the way you, you are at work, that's the way you drive your car or sit on your sofa at home in the evenings, 
then the cumulative stress across maybe 15, 20, 25 years longer into that disc will mean that the same extreme strength that it has uh, as a healthy disc will gradually decrease and decrease and decrease over the years. And then at a certain point, you may bend to pick something up, you may twist to, to uh, let's say, strike a hockey ball in a, in a hockey match and pop the disc ruptures. And um, that really is a great example of the straw that breaks the camel's back. So it wasn't the fact that you just bent to tie your shoelace that caused the disc injury. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was really, it was the 20 years of sitting with poor ergonomics that caused the uh, weakness in the disc to arise. And then you ended up bending to tie your shoelace or pick something up off the floor and pop the disc goes. So with that in mind, when something like that happens, of course, it's painful. Okay. And the pain is perceived by the neural subsystem. So you, we've talked about the active, we've talked about the passive. Now we're going back to the neural subsystem again. So let's say someone's just blown their disc out. Someone's uh, had uh, you know, a, a cruciate ligament injury or indeed any injury in the body. We know we're injured because we're in pain. The pain is, is being um, registered or indeed created, you could argue, by the nervous system. So that's the neural subsystem. Now, the interesting thing about pain is, of course, that it has a function. And um, I've, I've got a book actually called The Gift of Pain. And um, it was written by a doctor who spent a lot of time in India actually working in uh, leprosy colonies. And one of the features of leprosy is that you lose the ability to sense pain. And, you know, he saw so many injuries as a result of leprosy that he started to really recognize that pain truly is a gift. And this is why in the Czech system, we teach that pain is really a teacher. So we call it the pain teacher. If, if you get an injury, then you're having a visit from the pain teacher. So really the question is, is what is the pain trying to teach us? And um, you know, if you have a model, like Punjabi's model, then you can look back and say, okay, well, I'm feeling pain. Um, the physio or the doctor tells me I've injured my cruciate ligament. What is that telling me? Well, Generally speaking, it's telling you that there's something has been going on that has weakened that tissue across a period of time. And this is where sometimes the medical system goes into repair mode and says, okay, we'll operate on that, we'll stitch it back together. But the problem with that is that it's not really dealing with the original cause. Okay, So the original cause in Michael Owen's case was probably what we call quad dominance, which is where the quadriceps activate more strongly than the hamstring and often the gluteal group. So the, the muscles on the front of the thigh activate more strongly than the muscles on the back of the thigh. And the end result of that is it creates a shear in the uh, cruciate ligament, which with it, every step you take will uh, stress that ligament. Okay, so, so talking about the pain, now the pain is a neural phenomenon. So it's, it's back to the top of that Panjabi's model. And what that means is that the pain we know has an impact on the active subsystem. Because what we know is that when people are in pain, the pain will inhibit that inner component of the active subsystem. So what we call the inner unit or the deep muscles that stabilize the joint or you know, with the disc injury, they'll stabilize the spine. And so there's lots of research. Again, this is kind of the complexity side of it, going back, stepping back into the complexity to say that when someone has pain in their back, certain muscles will become inhibited and shut down. In other words, they don't fire at all or they don't fire when they should do. So the interesting thing there is that if someone comes in to see me in my clinic in pain in their low back, well, I can assess them and almost straight away I can find muscles that are not firing. Now, that doesn't mean that I can just instantly get those muscles to fire and the pain goes. What we actually have to do is we have to bear in mind that pain will continue to inhibit or shut down those muscles until we manage the pain effectively. And this is where sometimes a pharmaceutical approach can be beneficial because sometimes by taking a painkiller, for example, it can inhibit, it can stop those pain messages. And because the pain messages are stopped, now we have a better chance of reactivating the inner muscles. The challenge though is that of course some Injuries are extremely painful and painkiller won't sort that. And of course, the danger of a painkiller is that you can start to move 
when you shouldn't do because essentially what you're doing is you are snipping the warning light in the car it's like you know the petrol light comes on and you think oh that's a pain i'll snip the cord which is the painkiller and then i won't see that light anymore but that's actually a warning sign it's telling you you need to rest this area you need to get some rehabilitation here don't do that same movement again that just injured you okay so that's what the pain messages are for and that's the gift of pain but so if the pain's inhibiting these deep inner muscles then what that means is the body strategizes and it activates the outer muscles more. And that's a great strategy because it means you can still move, hopefully. It means that um, you can uh, still get by on a day-to-day -day basis. But what we also know is that unless the pain is managed effectively and unless the um, inner muscles are rehabilitated, even after the pain has gone, those muscles don't start to fire again. Now, one of the roles of those deep inner muscles, so we're, we're now going back to the active subsystem, the muscular system, is that they, they control the fine movement. So they have what's called fine motor control. They're very, very sensory. So what it means is that they send really useful and intelligent information back into the neural subsystem. So when they're working, you're getting a, a really good readout of what's going on in the joints. But if they are shut down, now you don't get such a good sense of what's going on in the joint. You lose what's called joint position sense. Okay, So it's really important as part of the rehabilitation process, we reactivate those muscles. And there's a whole number of ways you can do that. There's very specific exercises that can do that. There's kind of clever clinical techniques that can help to reactivate those muscles. But this is where really we need to consult with someone who understands what they're doing to be able to help reactivate those muscles. Now, as I mentioned, those muscles may not reactivate effectively if pain is still present. So it can be really helpful to see someone who's good at getting you out of pain. So there's many manual therapists out there, for example, that are great at getting people out of pain and helping that process along. So you might go to see a physiotherapist, a sports massage therapist, you might see an osteopath, a, a chiropractor, there's many, many different disciplines that can help to relieve pain. And that's where the value of these disciplines really is, is in helping reduce the pain. Now, when the pain starts to subside, some of the, uh, the specialists in those fields can then help you to reactivate those muscles as well. And that's very important. Now, if you don't reactivate those muscles, then what happens is the outer muscles... So remember, the active system has the inner and the outer muscles. And the outer muscles are a little bit clumsy. They're not nearly as refined as the inner muscles. And what we know is that when the outer muscles contract, they generate a lot of power, but they're not very good at controlling the position of the joint itself or the disc itself. So what it can do is it can create more shear into that joint, into that ligament, into that disc. So by not reactivating that inner unit, the inner musculature, you can end up with certainly compensating, certainly getting by, but the outer muscles are now trying to do the job of two different systems. So, and they create more shear at the joint, and this can then create stress, ongoing stress, into the passive subsystem. And you can get caught in a loop where that stress creates, creates pain in the passive subsystem again, the passive subsystem pain is directed back into the neural system. The neural system says, up, oh, yep, this area is in pain. And therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to shut down that inner unit again. So the inner unit gets inhibited. So obviously, we need to, to reactivate that inner unit. Now, when we, when we do that, if we can do that successfully, what it does is it minimizes stress through the passive subsystem, through the joint, through the con connective tissue, through the ligament, through the disc. And in doing that, now the disc is supported or the ligament is supported. And that means that there's no pain coming from it. That means that the neural subsystem can do its job and you get into what's called a virtuous circle. So rather than being in a vicious circle or vicious cycle, you go into a virtuous cycle and you can start to repair. And that's where good manual therapy, a good rehabilitation specialist can really help someone. However, there's much more to it than just that. As, as uh, alluded to in the introduction, there's a huge amount of complexity involved with this. And one of the things that can cause issues with muscle firing is another neural input, which is input 
from the organs or the viscera. And so many of us, in fact, all of my, my patients that come to see me, when I, when I uh, initially speak with them and explain what I do and how I help to rehabilitate and give them the tools to get themselves better, what I explain is that I need to get a um, series of questionnaires filled out so that I have a good understanding for how their hormonal, their limbic emotional, and their visceral systems are functioning. And so I send a questionnaire and it gives me all this feedback to say, well, there's stress on that organ, there's stress on this organ, there's stress in this emotional component of this person's life. Um, maybe there's, there's stress on, um, on a gland or, or a hormonal system. And, um, and what that tells me is how well they're likely to respond to treatment or lifestyle or exercise interventions. So a great example here is that when people have digestive issues, often you'll find that they bloat. Okay, so many people have experienced this. Probably most people will have done. You've eaten something. Um, it might be just a normal meal to you, but it's made you bloat. And some people start to, you know, suss out that actually, you know what? It's when I eat bread, I get bloated. It's when I eat rice, I get bloated. And people who are really paying attention, they'll notice that certain foods make them bloat. Now, what's happening there? is you're getting inflammation in the digestive system as a result of what you've just eaten. And gluten is a very good example of this, but there's many examples in the human diet. And also, in fact, medical drugs can make you bloat as well, and they can create inflammation in the digestive system. So, um, and of course, I'm not saying all medical drugs do that, but it's one of the most common side effects of medical drugs is to create digestive inflammation or irritation. So this irritation, what it does is it fires the nerves in the organ system or the visceral system. And those nerves, they feed back into the neural system because they, they are neural. So the, now the nervous system is sensitized. So it's kind of uh, on red alert. And what happens when the nervous system gets sensitized is that you get more aware of things like pain. So whereas someone who has, let's say, irritable bowel syndrome and a disc injury may be in pain, someone who has no irritable bowel syndrome and a disc injury may have no pain. So here's one of the things that we know about disc injury is that most people have disc injuries. It seems to be almost a normal part of life that we get wear and tear, we get injuries, we get disc bulges, this kind of thing. But a lot of people have no symptoms whatsoever. Now, why is it that they get no symptoms, whereas someone else may get terrible symptoms? Well, one very likely answer is that the person that's getting terrible symptoms has other stuff that's irritating their nervous system. So the neural component of Punjabi's model is already irritated. It only takes a small further irritation, and now they've got perhaps quite significant pain. So now that, of course, as we've already talked about, pain can inhibit the inner or the deep muscles around the spine. So now you've got a kind of double whammy. You've got an injury there which is generating some sensory drives into the neural system. But you've also got um, a visceral issue or a gut issue that's causing irritation to the nervous system as well. Now that irritation, what it does is it shuts down the inner unit. And it, that is actually what bloating is. A lot of people think that bloating is gas or it's wind. And often they feel a bit relieved if they belch or if they, they uh, pass wind. And, um, and so there's some truth to that. But the research that's been done into this shows that the bloating is only accounted for uh, 18%. That's one eight percent of the bloating is accounted for by gas. So then the other 82% has to be down to something else. And what it's down to is it's down to the muscles being inhibited again, just like they were with pain. So the irritating food or medical drug or whatever it is that you've, you've taken into the body, actually additives are very common uh, irritation, um, very common irritants to the digestive system as well. So if you're not eating organic foods, you're eating sort of standard food with lots of uh, additives in it, colorings and preservatives and this kind of thing, 
then those can also create irritation. And indeed, glyphosate, which is the pesticides that are sprayed on cereals, so if you were to eat Kellogg's cereals, for example, or any commercial cereal, unless it's organic, it will have glyphosate in it. And glyphosate is a strong irritant to the digestive system as well. So these are all examples that probably many people are experiencing on a daily basis without realizing. Um, and it's creating irritation to their digestive system, which as I mentioned, predisposes you not only to pain conditions, but also to bloating and to inhibition of the muscles that stabilize the joints. So now let's imagine you're a standard person in, you know, a industrialized society. You have cereal for breakfast, bread for breakfast. It's not organic. You have sandwich for lunch. You have pasta for dinner. None of it's organic. And you're getting glyphosate into your system the whole time. You might also be reactive to something in the grains, something like gluten, there's other substances, fructan is another common one. Um, you know, many people react to milk and to dairy, other people react to soya, other people react to rice. These are some of the most common food allergens or, or irritants. Any of those things, if you're reacting to them, they will be creating neural drives from the digestive system. So it's a neural part of the subsystem again, which is sensitizing the neural system and inhibiting the inner part of the active system. So now you're running around playing your sport, picking up your kids, jumping in the car, doing the gardening, doing the housework, doing the washing up, whatever it is, but you're doing it all using primarily the outer system. Now the outer system, as I mentioned earlier, is not only the power system, you know, it's the strength system and it moves you, but it fatigues early. So if you're feeling tired, if your muscles are feeling achy, if you feel like you don't have the energy that you used to, well, it could purely be that your digestive system is creating irritation that's shutting down the inner muscles, and therefore you're relying on the outer muscles to try and stabilize you. So if we go back to Michael Owen, I don't know anything about his medical history other than what's been in the press, but imagine if he had something like a gluten intolerance or some kind of irritation in his digestive system. Well, if that were the case, then he could still run around, he could still play football, because remember the outer system, which generates power and strength and speed, he can still play. But the issue is, is that that system fatigues early. And so this is why most sports injuries occur towards the end of a match or a game, because the system's starting to fatigue, and you see that the incidence of injuries goes up as the person fatigues. Now, someone who's, who's fit, well-conditioned, and everything's working well, generally they can last the full game without an injury. But you've got someone like Michael Owen who got seven or eight hamstring strains in one season. Well, perhaps around that time his digestive system was inflamed, and who knows what might have been causing that. There's many possibilities. But it's an extremely common finding. So I mentioned the questionnaire I send to patients. When I send that questionnaire out, I would say somewhere around 80% of people that fill that in have some kind of digestive, it might even be higher than 80%, but they have some kind of digestive irritation. So if Michael Owen was one of those people, well, he'd be running around on the pitch, he'd be performing really well, but because he's using the outer system to not only move him around, but also to try and stabilize, well, it gets fatigued even quicker. And so then he gets his hamstring strain, okay? And so then, you know, that happens again and again. He gets scar tissue in the hamstrings. The hamstrings stop doing their role across a period of time, of course, because the hamstrings are dynamic agonists to his anterior cruciate ligament. What happens is that cruciate ligament gets more and more stressed. The stress creates a weakening or a lack of tensile strength in the ligament. And then suddenly, in one game playing for England, the anterior cruciate ligament ruptures. And if you see the footage, which I have on the slideshow, which uh, you'll be able to see on Vimeo, on our Vimeo channel, well, you can see he barely does anything. He, he literally receives the ball on the wing, he goes to turn, not at high speed, and then he falls over and he crawls off the pitch. And that was him rupturing his anterior cruciate ligament. Now, if that anterior cruciate ligament was healthy and had the tensile strength greater than steel, then there's no way that would have happened but it did and so we can pretty much surmise confidently that it lost its tensile strength across a period of time. Now to give you an idea on the tensile strength of steel, now let me just let you know, I don't know the tensile strength of steel exactly, but what I do know is the tensile strength of ligaments. But to give you an idea, 
a ligament has a tensile strength of somewhere between 250 kilograms and 1,280 kilograms per square centimeter. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, it's very difficult to know what that means. It sounds strong, right? And we know it's stronger than steel. So we know steel is extremely strong. But to give you an idea, muscle also is very strong. Okay, you know that when you're running, you're transferring huge loads through your legs. So you're transferring about three times body weight through your legs. You imagine your own body weight. For me, I'm close to 100 kilograms. So it's quite a lot of weight. So when I'm running, let's make it 100 because it's, it's easier to calculate. But 100 kilograms is passing through each leg as I run. But because of the momentum of me running, what you find is that actually the loads are three times that. So each time I take a step, I'm transferring 300 kilograms through each leg. Now, if you've ever tried to pick up even 100 kilograms, that's an incredibly heavy load. Now, someone who is 100 kilograms like me should be able to do that. As a good benchmark for fitness and health and function, you should be able to pick up roughly your own body weight without too much of a problem. Um, but it's extremely heavy, so it's right towards the high end of the most you could lift unless you've trained up to lift heavier, okay? So, so muscles are extremely strong. Now, that's just running. If you were to jump, you get nine times body weight going through one leg. So that's 900 kilograms going through one leg. And the most that people can squat, even the Olympians that are, you know, doing their powerlifting in the Olympics, what you find is that the, the strongest people in the world can only lift about three times their own body weight, okay? So only, of course, that's incredible. But when the average Joe is down the park playing a bit of cricket with their kids, they go to bowl the cricket ball, they're putting nine times body weight through one leg, and they haven't done any of the conditioning that the Olympic lifters, and they don't have the genetic adaptations and, and uh, you know, the genetic gift that some of these lifters have. So just puts it in perspective, it's extremely high loads, but those are the kinds of loads that your body can take. When I was doing my master's degree, I found that when you sprint, the gastrocnemius muscle, which is the calf muscle, takes up to 22 times body weight, and the quadriceps take 33 times body weight. So in my case, that would be 3,300 kilograms going through my thigh muscles as I'm sprinting. Crazy amounts of load. Okay, now, muscle has a tensile strength of five kilograms per centimeter squared, okay? Now, back to the, the ligaments. Ligaments have a tensile strength of 250 kilograms to 1,280 kilograms per centimeter squared. So it gives you an idea. Crazy, crazy amounts of strength. So let's have a, a think about a different part of the body. Let's think about the shoulder. Well, when you get a shoulder injury, what often happens is that the it's a ball and socket joint. And one of the things with the shoulder is that you have a lot of mobility there. You can move it through a huge range of motion. So you always get mobility at the price of stability. So in other words, what you've got is you've got a passive subsystem there that's extremely flexible. The, the joint itself has all kinds of folds in it, the, the joint capsule, which means that you can have a huge amount of flexibility there, much more so than something like a knee or even a hip. And so the passive subsystem is flexible, which means that it has to depend a lot more on the neural subsystem and the active subsystem to stabilize it. So any kind of um, uh, negative impact on that active or neural subsystem can have quite profound effects for the shoulder. It's also the reason that the shoulder itself is the most dislocated joint because it's the most mobile. So, you know, with a shoulder joint, the shoulder has to have very refined control. And indeed, it's highly proprioceptive, which means that it has a very good awareness of what position it's in at any moment in time. And that's, of course, controlled by very refined nerves and very kind of um, high control muscles. So these muscles are often quite tonic, and particularly the deeper fibers of these muscles are very tonic. So they're the inner fibers, the inner units, if you like. And so if you were to get any kind of um, disturbance to the information coming back from the shoulder, such as pain, or if you were to get an organ that might refer to the shoulder, so now the stomach tends not to refer to the shoulder so much. It can refer to the back of the shoulder, to the shoulder blade kind of area, but other muscles, other organs such as the liver, uh, the pancreas, um, the stomach can a little bit, but, but it's primarily 
the liver, the heart, the lungs, the diaphragm, they can all refer to the shoulders. Now, any issues there, whether it be tension in the diaphragm, which often is related to holding emotions. So, um, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that emotions can contribute here because, of course, they are neural, so they can have an effect on the active subsystem. Well, these things can all potentially impact on the function of the shoulder. Um, so the organs, neural drives from those, the ones we just mentioned, they can impact on the function of the shoulder. That's not to say if you have a shoulder injury that you have a, um, a heart condition or a liver condition or anything like that. But what it does mean is that if you've got something like a heart condition or a liver condition, then that can actually predispose you to shoulder injuries. And uh, it may not even be a condition. Now, th this is something that we test for on the check system is we look for physiological load or stress. And you'll find more about that on, on my website if you want to dig into that. Um, but what that can do is it can both uh, cause um, an increased propensity to, to injury in any case you know just having high physiological load which essentially is high stress on the system and that might be through poor diet or poor lifestyle habits or um, poor exercise choices that kind of thing but also what it does is it is a precursor to what's called um, central sensitization and central sensitization is where the central nervous system is kind of on a red alert it's kind of uh, hyper vigilant if you like and, and what that means is that certain muscles, and again, returning to, to the active component of, of Punjabi's model, yeah, the active component, as we've described several times, can be broken down to the inner, inner unit muscles and the outer unit muscles. And those inner unit muscles can be impacted by central sensitization. So we know that, for example, the tonic motor neurons get inhibited by pain, but they also seem to be impacted by this kind of cumulative effect of sensitization on the central nervous system. And that can therefore, you know, if we're talking about the shoulder, that of course will disrupt the optimal uh, mechanical functioning of the shoulder. And so you might be doing everything else right, but if you've got stress on your organs, then that could be enough to create a shoulder injury. So if we look at this in terms of performance, of course, that's going to compromise your ability to, let's say, accurately throw something, uh, to um, be able to uh, catch something accurately, those kinds of things. And uh, of course, for someone who is playing sports, whether that be just for fun, recreation, or, or more seriously, or professionally, that's going to have a potential impact. Uh, it certainly could have an impact in the, in the short term and in the longer term as you fatigue earlier, of course, because that outer unit is dominant and the inner unit is shut down, then what that means is that uh, you, your performance is going to tail off. So from a performance perspective, it's not a great uh, scenario to be caught in. For, for many of us, of course, the, one of the, the, the interesting things behind all this is that what they find is that, that there's research which I quoted in one of my recent papers um, let me just think what it was called. It was uh, called um, modern disintegration primal connectivity. So we're talking about the connective tissues, the passive subsystem. But um, what has been found is that when people have um, markers of cardiovascular disease, in other words, the heart's under a little bit of stress, then they are more prone to various injuries in the upper limb, things from carpal tunnel syndrome to um, tennis elbow to uh, rotator cuff injuries, even nerve impingements in the upper limb. And that could well be as a result of some kind of underlying stress on an organ, which is impacting on the musculoskeletal function. So in other words, a neural component is affecting the active subsystem and, uh, and ultimately causing injury. So that is essentially creating a, an impact on the neural component, which is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, inhibiting these inner uh, muscles which provide fine motor control and there goes your shoulder in the next time you go to catch a ball or strike a ball or throw a ball or throw a throw a uh, you know a punch or serve a tennis ball whatever it might be okay so let's let's look at this model from a slightly different angle now and if we were to look at it from the perspective of um, uh, an, another key model that's that's uh, being used a lot in in rehabilitation at the moment and has been for you know uh, a number of decades actually uh, by by various people is uh, the biopsychosocial model and um, so what this is really saying is that a lot of what we're describing with Panjabi's model is biological is is within the body um, but there's also a psychological component and a sociological component so let's let's look at that now. 
if we consider the neural subsystem is where, of course, the brain is part of the neural subsystem. And the brain is affected by uh, not just um, your own experiences, but by the experiences of your society. So, so the way we behave is related to the society that we live in. So, for example, some societies, they're more uh, okay with not wearing shoes, for example. Um, some societies are okay with more nakedness and less nakedness. Yeah. Um, the kinds of foods we eat. If, if someone were to ask a, um, a businessman in London to eat some witchetty grubs, even though apparently they taste really good, they're like a really creamy mozzarella, um, the idea of a witchetty grub to uh, a London-based businessman is going to be completely different um, because of the society that they've grown up in and therefore the impact on their psychology um, and uh, therefore you know, their behavior. Um, whereas if you were to give that to an Australian Aboriginal, that would be a real treat and a delight. So, so that's an example of how our society influences our minds. But tied in with that is the fact that um, you know back pain is viewed in our society as a real inconvenience. Um, in fact, probably in most societies it would be. But um, in some societies, you have to get by. You have to keep going out to the fields or go out on the hunt or, or go out to work and um, what we find is that actually in countries where manual labor is more um, required as part of the kind of economic environment, then you find that back pain is much less of an issue. Now, that could be somewhat to do with the conditioning of the body, which would be bio, but it could also be very much related to the requirement to continue to move. So the psycho and the social needs of that uh, person in that society. So what we find in societies where you've got more of a desk-based uh, population, where a lot more office workers, is that uh, back pain is often seen as something that is, um, you know, not only uh, literally a pain um, and an inconvenience, but also because of the availability of information and because of the um, the, the lack of requirement to keep moving, then what you find is that many people uh, will stop moving, they'll start to catastrophize about the pain, they'll exhibit things like fear avoidance behaviors and so on. And often this is related to information that can be tracked down on the internet, maybe from talking to friends and so on. So there's a social impact. If you imagine in, in the UK or in the US, um, you might uh, find someone with acute low back pain and all their friends and family saying, oh, you've got to lie down, you've got, you know, you've got to rest. Even their doctor may be saying, you've got to rest, you know, don't, don't load your system. Whereas in a society where you've got uh, a need to get back out into the fields or, you know, on the hunt, it'd be like, well, you've got to get over it. You know, you've got, you've got to come out, we've got to get digging, we won't have any dinner, um, whatever it is. And so there's a different social pressure and a different psychological pressure. And interesting enough, as I said, it seems like in these uh, more manual labor based societies, the back pain isn't nearly as much of a problem. So there could well be a, a, a psychological and a social aspect to, to back pain. And of course, that's coming in at the neural subsystem level. So when, when you look at that neural component, well, you know, it incorporates people's beliefs, their emotions, their fears, their concerns, as well as their joy and, and their, their sort of uh, awe and amazement with, with, with life and with events. But so it's very important when we're looking at rehabilitation or indeed injury prevention and performance that the neural subsystem is set optimally and that's one area where certainly in manual therapies uh, and rehabilitation we're often um, guilty of, of not providing enough of the stimulus and a good example here um, that I would give is that it's been known since 1996 that after you've had a bout of back pain this is in a you know an industrialized society so this is most of this research was done in Australia um, but after you've had a bout of low back pain then the inner unit muscles do not switch back on effectively unless you've been rehabilitated. So in other words, muscles around the spine, like the deep multifidus muscle and the transversus abdominis, these muscles don't reactivate unless they're retrained. So essentially what you do is you find compensation mechanisms. And probably in a more natural environment, because you're forced to go out and continue to move and to put the system under stress, those muscles will switch back on automatically. But because we tend to, you know, mollycoddle ourselves, wrap ourselves up in cotton wool and uh, to not exercise and uh, avoid anything that might, uh, you know, aggravate the situation, make it worse, we have that kind of mindset, then what it means is that uh, we don't reactivate these muscles. Now, 
what this group from Australia found was that even after the pain has gone, those muscles haven't reactivated. And so we've got a situation there where the neural subsystem is still compromised. The uh, active subsystem, the inner, inner unit of the um, Punjabi's model is still compromised. And so essentially what we're getting by on is just the outer unit, the passive structures, so the joints, ligaments, tendons, etc., and and the rest of the, the nervous system that's not still impacted. So, so what that means is that unless we make the choice to rehabilitate ourselves properly or to push ourselves back into working with full function, those muscles won't reactivate. And this, this is one of the slight issues with our focus on pain as the key driver for uh, rehabilitation or uh, for, let's say, not exercising. Because the moment the pain's gone, then we will start going back into exercise again and we won't have that deep inner system working optimally. So the the, the notion here is that if you are in a, a society where those demands are forced upon you, then you're much more likely to work through it and to, to not have the inhibition of these inner muscles right from early on in the, the rehabilitation. Now one of the things with this is that anxiety and fear and depression and all of those emotions that can come with um, a persistent pain issue, those emotions can actually create what's called a, a descending inhibition of the musculature. And so in other words, you, you change the way you move because of the fear and the anxiety. Now, if you just have to get over the fear, you have to get over the pain and, and get back into work, then that's going to create a very different complexity to the way you move and what you do with your body and how those muscles reactivate. So, you know, what this comes down to, you know, it's, it's kind of reflecting how different societies will affect our psychology. But, you know, at that psychological level, the neural level, then what we all have is choice. And choice is the, the choice whether to move or not to move. The choice whether to eat a certain food or not to eat that food. The choice whether to see a specialist or not see a specialist. There's many, many different, in fact, everything in life is a choice. But what we find is that actually we're programmed from very early in life with very specific behaviors that relate closely to our societal values and norms. And this means that we will tend to follow the choices of the society and, and believe that they're our own, when in fact they're really the societal norms. So sometimes we have to break out of the box and go against it. And, that, and that's often where, um, you know, pioneers work and where new innovations come from is where someone does something a bit differently and then you find it works really well so then you investigate it further and you, you carry on down that pathway. Now um, choice of course is an interesting thing because choice influences everything from the top down from the, the, the nervous system, the, the brain down into how we behave with our bodies but it's also a bottom up uh, process and what I mean by that is that at the, at the very basic level, at the very level of, of quantum, uh, what's called quantum superposition, the very atoms that we're made from are delineated. They are, they are brought into the field of action by the intention behind them. And this is where the intention behind healing or not healing, uh, the intention behind achieving something or not achieving something, goal setting, essentially, where this comes in. Because if we don't have a goal that's beyond the pain and beyond the disease, then what that means is that we stay stuck in a rut and, uh, and the, the, the choices we make often do not serve us. And so the example of the multifidus and the deep muscles that, that don't fire is a great example of this because what's happening is if our choice is to get out of pain, then getting out of pain is it's not a bad choice. But really, we can get out of pain and still be dysfunctional because as the research showed, you uh, will not necessarily reactivate the stabilizer muscles, the inner muscles, until such time as you have either seen someone who knows what they're doing or you've taken on certain activities, which in a natural environment you probably would have to do, such as you know running, climbing, twisting, turning. Um, bending, you know, all of the all of these movement patterns. 
Similarly, you know, our choices of foods tend to go with the society that we live in. So if we live in a society that has cereal for breakfast and sandwiches for lunch and pasta for dinner, then that's what we tend, those are the choices we tend to make. And those choices will are neural subsystems, so that, that's your, your mind and the society helping you make that choice. But then it's having its impact on the biology, which is the active subsystem and your ability to stabilize your joints. So you can see that Punjabi's model also ties in very closely with the biopsychosocial model. Now, you know, there's there's a number of other things we could talk about. Um, we've I've mentioned that we would go into ankle sprain, so let's look at that briefly. Now, the ankle typically goes into what's called an inversion sprain. So you typically roll over on the foot and you strain the ligaments on the outside of the ankle. That's the most common ankle sprain you can get. And um, that means that, you, of course, you feel, you, first of all, you've traumatized the passive subsystem at the, at the ankle. But that trauma to the passive subsystem, again, is perceived by the nervous system, so the neural subsystem. And it's perceived as pain. And then the pain, again, inhibits musculature around the ankle, so you can't move it much initially. But also what we know is it inhibits a muscle in the hip called the gluteus medius, uh, and sometimes the gluteus maximus as well. So there's research on that. And what that means is that um, you can't easily load bear on that leg. Now, that's kind of functional when you just sprain the ankle. But again, that can stay with you because one of the things that we know is that pain reprograms the motor pathways in the nervous system quicker than any other stimulus. So whilst you're in pain, uh, if you start to walk with a limp, then you will tend to reprogram your gait motor pattern. So in other words, the motor program that's in the brain for walking. And you will learn to walk with a limp. And this is very common with people that either have recurrent ankle sprains or that have had a serious ankle sprain uh, you know, in their formative years, you can analyze them. And even though they have no pain left, they're still walking with a limp. Well, you know, why is that? We've just kind of explained it. But, but the thing is, is that what is happening is the nervous system isn't activating the active subsystem effectively. So again, the uh, inner muscles, so the ones that stabilize the hip on that side are not being activated as a result of an old ankle sprain. So this is something that can be picked up on in assessment sometimes, something that people may notice, but also ironically what it does is it predisposes you to future ankle sprains. So, you know, when you've sprained your ankle once, there's, there's a couple of reasons why you could be more predisposed. And first of all is that probably you haven't dealt with what caused it or predisposed you to it in the first instance. That could just be a, a fluke, uh, sometimes it is, um, but what's happened is through having a, a sprain of the ankle, you've traumatized the passive subsystem of the joint, and so you've lost some stability there. So in order to effectively rehabilitate that, you wanna work with the neural subsystem and the active subsystem so that you can optimize the support for that passive subsystem. So that's the way I would look at it from a rehabilitation perspective. And in doing that, of course, what you do is you work on the hip musculature, which we were just talking about, and the abdominal musculature, which also helps to stabilize the pelvis and therefore provides a stable base for the leg to operate from. Now, if you don't do that, then another reason that you can be predisposed is that those muscles in the hip won't refire again because you've relearned how to walk. And what it means is that as you walk along and take a step on that leg that was injured but is now recovered, your weight will shift out over that leg. And in shifting out over that leg, it makes you more prone to rolling the ankle at the bottom of the, the, the leg. And so this is what's called in medical terms, it's called a Trendelenburg pattern or sometimes a, a compensated Trendelenburg pattern. And that would also predispose you to injury there and re recurrence of injury. So by understanding the Punjabi's model, then what you can do is you can ensure that you minimize risk of future injury and you optimize recovery of those ligaments in the ankle. So there's another example there. Now, there are certain tissues in the body which are difficult to classify as either passive or active or neural because, for example, the fascia, um, which is the connective tissues which you find wrapped around muscles and wrapped around joints and wrapped around organs, that actually has smooth muscle cells in it. So it can tighten up if, it, if you're under stress and it can relax off when you are relaxed and in a, in a rest and digest state. So the fascia has a kind of... Um, component to it, which means it sits somewhere between the passive and the active components of Punjabi's model. But it's also very proprioceptive. So it's actually feeding information back into the neural system. Um, now, so there's a lot of talk about fascia at the moment, because it's one of those tissues that uh, has 
traditionally been disregarded. It's, it's something that used to be just cut out when anatomists were looking for the what they consider the more important parts of the body, such as the, the, the muscles and the bones and the ligaments and the nerves and so on. But its role is becoming increasingly understood as a, an organ of feedback and proprioception, as well as providing structural integrity. So one of the things that we know is that if people are stressed, for example, or if they have a breathing pattern disorder, which is comes with anxiety, so we, we're heading back up towards the neural side of the triads of the, of the model. So stress, fear, worry, anxiety, all of those things will um, trigger an increased breathing response. So your breathing rate goes up. What that does is it sends you into a fight flight state and that in turn increases tone in the smooth muscle fibers, which means that your fascia tightens up. So if you know you're particularly tight, then you might do really well with some deep breathing and some stretching. And that's what's known as yoga. <laughs> um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be yoga. It could just be stretching on the floor, doing some breathing, doing some relaxation. And that can also then help the whole system to function better. So by breathing slowly, calmly, deeply, that relaxes the nervous system, makes you more rest and digest, not so fight flights. Then the fascia relaxes off. Now the joints move better, so there's less stress on the joints. And because the joints are moving better, the muscles can work through a fuller range, but also the joints will be providing good information back to the nervous system to tell the nervous system what position they're in and therefore the nervous system can activate the muscles better. So one, one of the examples I used to give of Punjabi's model when I was involved with um, the Vibram Five Fingers and barefoot running is that if you've got a flat foot, for example, well, if you put a, a support under that foot, then what it does is it doesn't really give the nervous system any additional useful feedback. Normally what a foot should do is that as you land load on it, as you're walking, the foot should roll into a movement called pronation, which is where the arch flattens down a little bit. And as that arch flattens, so then the connective tissues, the passive subsystem in the arch, will get stretched and will send a message to the neural subsystem to say, ah, the foot's going into pronation, let's activate the muscles that prevent pronation. So they're, they're supination muscles or, or antipronation muscles. And that will mean that we can stabilize the joint and we can continue moving forwards in what's called the sagittal plane, so straight ahead, um, without losing energy into the frontal plane, so that's moving sideways. So pronation is essentially a movement that kind of takes you sideways. It's not very efficient if you're trying to move forwards. I should say over pronation, by the way, just to clarify. Um, pronation is quite normal. Over pronation, probably less than ideal because it's, it's uh, overstressing these connective tissues in the foot and it's taking you into a kind of sideways movement. So, um, so when the nervous system can read that the foot's going to pronation, it tells the antipronation muscles to activate, those antipronation muscles activate, and they prevent overstretch on those connective tissues in the sole of the foot, so you don't end up with overpronation. But if you were to put an arch support in there, which has been the way that we've kind of thought about this for some time now, then what happens is, of course, the foot rolls into pronation, but those connective tissues don't get stretched because essentially they're being held in a shortened position. That doesn't provide information to the nervous system. So the nervous system doesn't know it should activate its antipronation muscles. So then those antipronation muscles don't get activated. So you get deconditioning of those muscles and the problem just persists and worsens. So really the body's hugely set up to function well if it's allowed to function well. And Punjabi's model gives us all kinds of insights into how that works. Now, you know, one other thing I was going to mention is uh, gut health. And um, the reason I mentioned gut health is that gut health not only can create inhibition of the, the inner unit if it's poor. So if you've got irritation to the gut, then that's an organ, the gut and it will refer back into the spine at, right at the levels where the abdominal wall is fed from, and then the abdominal wall gets inhibited as a result of poor gut function. But also, poor gut function has been shown to be correlated with brain function. So, so if you're eating uh, too much sugar, or you're eating on the run the whole time, or too many grains, or things that you're intolerant to, then these things can all create imbalances in the gut, inflammation in the gut, and you can end up with an imbalance in the bacteria. 
um, you've probably heard a lot about the microbiome recently. Well, that's uh, and dysbiosis is another term, but that's that's a term for the the bacterial balance being out in the digestive system. Now, when that occurs, it creates a negative impact on our ability to produce serotonin because most of the body's serotonin, I believe, it's seventy percent of the body's serotonin, is made in the gut. And serotonin is the very chemical that keeps you happy and prevents you from getting depression. So there's this very close correlation with gut issues and depression. And then we know depression, and of course this is all kind of affecting the neural subsystem, remember, but then depression and gut issues can both impact on the inner units and so you can end up with stability issues and inability to move effectively and efficiently. And so then that can make you less happy, can make you more in pain or predispose you to pain and put stress onto your passive subsystem. So the ligaments and the joints and the discs in the spine and so on. And you can end up with a kind of cascade of, uh, of issues there. So really, you know, what the model shows us is that unless you're thinking holistically and working holistically to maintain optimal health and function performance, then the likelihood is that the system is going to break down in some way. And so when it does break down, which of course it does for most of us at some point, whether that be through injury or through overload or repetitive strain injuries or, or you know, gut infections or stress, uh, lifestyle stress, well, when those things happen, then when we look at the model, it gives us a kind of map to help us get back on track, to help us create a program of rehabilitation, either for ourselves or for our clients, or to explain how best to work with a rehabilitation program with the client in a very simple manner. And this is an example of simplicity on the other side of complexity. If you enjoyed that first edition of FC20 Solo, please feel free to share it and drop me a line if you have any other suggestions for subjects you'd like discussed either here on FC20 Solo or on FC20 with Matt Walden and guests. Just email me with your ideas on inquiries at mattwalden.com. So that's Matt with two T's and Walden with two L's. If you'd like to learn more about how Punjabi's model can be applied in the real world, I mention it in almost every one of my 20 plus webinars available on my website. So take a look there to dig deeper. And as a special offering to FC2O listeners, you can get 10% of any of my webinars on mattwalden.com by entering the following code. FC2010. So that's fc 2 O, and remember O is the uh, alphabetical O for order, from chaos to order. And then 10 is the numerals 1 and 0, FC20, 10. Make sure you subscribe so you're notified of the exciting topics we have coming up in future episodes. Thanks for listening to the show.